Hello, this is Stephen Al, and we are here with a top 10 video. Today, I'll be doing my top 10 favorite gangsters from TV. Now, everyone knows I'm a huge fan of gangsters, the old school mob, and I want to, and I'm deciding I'm going to do my top 10 from TV. Later down the line, I'll do my top 10 from movies. But here are my top 10 from TV. Now, this covers from any form of TV, regardless of genre, they have to be a gangster, at least has some kind of involvement in organized crime. They can be, regardless of background or what organization, they have to be gangsters. And I don't care even if the TV show is a drama, a comedy, action, or even a superhero type show, they have to be at least clear organized crime. And here are my top tens, but first let's hit into the honorable mention. I want to kick off this list with an honorable mention. So the honorable mention goes to Miguel Angelo Felix Garrado, El Parro from the um, TV show Narcos Mexico. So far they've only done two seasons, I'm not sure if they're onto a third. And I've honestly, I've always preferred the spin-off series to the original Narcos series. Here we get to see in the first season the man's rise to arguably one of the most infamous cartels in um, the history of the cartel trade. More than Pablo Escobar, more than El Chapo. He's betrayed by Diago Luna. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing that right and not butchering it, but I guess I like the. I just like the actor who gives this performance of this man who clearly just wants a better life and he could just see things that everyone else can't. I always liked him for that. Also, it's kind of different. Majority people on my list are traditional either gangsters or criminal masterminds. And some I think you would classify as gangsters, but I don't think you others will. But I always, but this is unique because rarely do I actually get to see a drug cartel, like drug cartel gangsters. And I honestly feel that this is a pretty damn good show. I've always liked it better than its uh, predecessor. And I don't know, it just feel, feels so authentic. With clearly, it's we are getting to see this, and most of them are speaking in this, in their foreign country rather than English. I don't know what more to talk about this show, other than I say if you haven't seen Narcos or the original, even I prefer the spin-off over the original. I can agree the original started it all. Give them a watch; they are on Netflix, and you will get a blast out of them just as I did. Now here we have Wilson Fisk, the Kingpin. For those who are huge comic book nerds, know the Kingpin is arguably one of the greatest gangsters in in the comic book realm. He is betrayed. He this version of the character appeared in the Netflix show Daredevil. Now King, now he was the main antagonist for seasons one and three, and was sort of a reoccurring character in season two. I like about this version is he's becoming. The Kingpin. In season 1, he wasn't fully the Kingpin, but he did own a large criminal network that involved incorporating other gangs. By season 3, he's rebuilding himself, he's taken the alias the Kingpin, and is rebuilding his criminal empire. Now, I like... Now, first off, Vincent Dionifro. Hopefully, I'm not butchering that last name, but for me, he is an actor I've seen him in so many things. He was in Law & Order, Criminal Intent, the remake Magnificent Seven, uh, Kill the Irishman. I've seen him in a lot of, th I've seen him in a few things, but this is arguably for me, I'll consider his greatest performance. He, the man just gives such a different take on the Kingpin. Here we get to see him a bit more human. We do get to see that he is ruthless, he is intelligent, he is viciously strong, and he is has the capability and the willpower but we also see his human side when it comes to Vanessa who he wants who a woman he loves very deeply and who wants to marry and spend the rest of his life with I also think that those two not the actors who play these characters share a good chemistry but work really well together so far the king now this ain't the first time we've seen the kingpin in live action he was in the daredevil movie who I felt the actor in that film did a pretty decent job but I feel that this is a far superior performance. It's so different, and it's also more. The guy, you can tell this guy taking creative liberties with his speech patterns and the way he talks. 
and just the commanding presence Vincent gives to this role. If they were to continue with Daredevil Season 4, which sadly they didn't, it was cancelled after three seasons, I would like to see how more we could have gotten with this role. Interesting fact, by Season 3, he's finally wearing the white suit that you see on screen. Again, he hadn't fully become the Kingpin or took the moniker until Season 3. In other words, this was a character we were seeing develop into the character he would become. And there's just something about him that he just does well. Now, I'm not sure if you'll classify him as a gangster or a criminal mastermind. I personally think he's a gangster, a, a crime lord. And to be honest, he is exactly like he was from the comics, a crime lord. And that's why I liked him so much. Of course, there's some things that he doesn't have. He Normally, he would have a trademark cane, but I guess this is a more modern take. And I like how the suit that he wears does echo him from the comics, but at least from the early comics, but at the same time, is still pretty a modern costume, or look, I should say. Number 9, we have Omar Little from the TV show The Wire, which was arguably one of the greatest TV shows from not just the HP, not just from HBO, but arguably in general. Omar Little was portrayed by Michael K. Williams, and he is more of a street bang criminal or gangster rather than the traditional mafiosos or crime lords that we normally see. Now, I already, now I will be honest, I haven't really, now I've seen a little bit of The Wire, I think the first three, maybe two seasons, not saying I hate the show, I'm just, not saying I hate the show, but I'm just, mm, I don't know, the sh I guess the show doesn't really hasn't grabbed me as much. Anyway, Omar Little is again a street gang, a street banger, a guy from the hood, who rose up in the who rose up to become one of the most well-known street bangers on the street, running his own, you know, a man who built himself. If I'm if I recall correctly, he's not really a part of any criminal organ well affiliated with any criminal organization other than himself and his own crew. But he lives by a strict code of morals, and when he goes to kill someone, he does this whistle that signifies to people that their deaths are coming. Michael managed to give this character a bit of personality to a normal guy you would expect just to be another street uh, gangbanger from the streets. But for me, it's personal opinion that he managed to bring him to breathe a different air of freshness and even of law into this guy. Like, again, he lives by a code. And that's the thing for some of these gangsters. They either live by a code or they view themselves as just someone who's trying to make their way up the ranks. He is a fun, absolutely great character, and it's all go to Michael's performance. If it wasn't for him, I don't think that this character would have even appeared on the list a, a bit. So I think as a lot goes, a lot of credit for this role to even work goes to um, Mr. Williams. Number 8 is Thomas Shelby from the TV show Peaky Blinders. Now, unlike most villains on or uh, gangsters on this list, mostly take place in the United States, well, except for the honorable mention, that took place somewhere in Mexico. This one has the dis dubious distinction to take place less in the United States, but more in from across the pond in London than the slums. Shall um, Thomas Shelby and his brothers run a notorious criminal gang known as the Peaky Blinders. He is a former, if I recall correctly, he's a former war veteran who wants to turn this gang into a full criminal syndicate. And involves heavily in horse racing and basically illegal gambling. Now, he is betrayed by Killian Murphy, and I, and for most Batman fans, would know this guy as playing the Scarecrow in the Christopher Nolan Dark Knight trilogy. Here, he portrays him as... A sort of guy from the slums who wants to rise up and it's a very and as a common story with most gangsters they come from low backgrounds and rise through the ranks now this takes place in a different time period um slightly i believe if i recall correctly just after world war and there's a lot of and he's quite the criminal mastermind and he's clearly runs this organization and I just like how he dresses, and he goes through, and he and his gang, which most of them consist of family and brothers, go up against arguably some of 
the worst the city of, you know, other criminal syndicates, and the per se with so much challenges. I like Shelby because he is an underdog. He and his whole organization, really. And not and we see him as he rises and rises as the series go on. He is just a phenomenal character. And again, most just like the previous, it goes down to show to the Shelby character being betrayed by such an accomplished actor. Now, why do I put him above uh, Michael? Well, first off, I prefer my gangsters to be more proper mobsters rather than street bangers. But I always but I put um, Omar Little ahead of the Kingpin because he breathed, a, made a character who, you know, could be a stereotype. But made it him have a air of freshness, and arguably made a character that seemed better. This guy is because he, as we go season by season, he is he is always the underdog, rising and rising, and we are rooting for him in a way. At least I am, and that's why I put him above Omar Little because I felt that his story was written better. When the other two were clearly meant to be either an antagonist. Or just minor back, or either just supporting character or background characters. Depends on how you view it. But I always preferred him above those two, and that's partly why. Number seven is Jax Teller from Sons of Anarchy. Here we go from gangsters to bikers. Jax Teller, at the beginning of the series, is the vice president in the Sons of Anarchy bike club, or as they call it, Sam Crow. And I'll be honest, there's a lot of people to take from this show and there's and I'm and I was almost tempted to give someone else the seventh spot over Jax Teller. Now I decided at the beginning of this list to pick one character from each series and tell you there is a lot of good characters from Sons of Anarchy. Clay Morrow, Tig, Bobby Elvis, Chibs, Juice, a lot of great characters, but I decided to go with its main lead, Jax Teller. I like him because at the beginning of the series, he is loyal to the club. And he has managed to outgrow the shadow of his old man, who was arguably one of the founding members of Sam Crow. And we see season by season him trying to keep the club going and the business running. If I could describe this whole show, it would be a Shakespeare story on a Harley. And that's kind of really describes Jax Teller's ca character. He's either suffering tragedy or has to overcome an obstacle per season to keep the club going. And also like how he lives by a strict code of morals. But as the seasons go on, they kind of get compromised a bit. And that really just goes to show just how hard it is for any person to stick by these codes and make them work. He was portrayed by Charlie Hunnaman. <coughs> Pray to God I'm pronouncing that last name right and not butchering it like I did with uh, Vincent's last name. Of course, by the end of th by the series, he does become president of the club and runs it his own way. And he is a really, I guess, a kind of. Now, the reason why I liked Jax Teller, he's kind of a bike. He's a biker, but he's also a laid-back dude, like a guy you would love to have a drink at the pub. And when a fight breaks out, he's the kind of person who will always have your back. He is a really... He... Uh, like I said, it was hard... He, Sons of Anarchy is a hard show for me to pick just one character from the show. It's really hard. But I decided to go with Jax Teller because of his unique story that we are following through the series. People would say, well, you... They would have preferred Clay Morrow, and I agree, he's of great... He's a very interesting character and very different, but I decided to go with Jax Teller. He's just a personal favorite of mine. Number six is Nucky Thompson, portrayed by Steve Buscemi. Hopefully that name is being pronounced right. Now, Nucky Thompson is Nucky Thompson is portray uh, is first off clearly meant to be the real life gangster Nucky Nucky Johnson. Um, and basically, he is a gangster who is a who is the lead, the leading mob figure in Atlantic City, and 
essentially, Broad Walk Empire takes place during the Prohibition era, when gangsters are getting fully involved in the booze trade, and he is essentially takes advantage of that to add to his criminal enterprise. He's also portrayed as being a businessman, a politician, and he is truly a gangst. He is truly a product of the 1920s. Of the 1920s. Now I like him because we get to see a gangster in that time period, and here he interacts with other notorious mem figures or mobsters of the era: Al Capone, Lucky Luciano, Arnold Rothstein, Meyer Lansky, just to name a few. Now there's a lot, just like Sons of Anarchy, there's a lot of good gangsters or gangster figure characters to pick from this series. But I decided to go with Nucky Thompson because he is a kind of an anti-hero. He's a guy you just can't help but like. And how he builds this criminal empire and how he really takes care of his community, how he interacts with people of the community. And the business dealings he's always making, I don't know, but there's just something about Steve's performance that makes it work. And this is, and he's arguably one of the consistency good things on the show. Now, don't get me wrong, the f I can say the first two seasons were great. Season 3 became a bit wonky, and the series kind of just went wonky from season to season until it was finally cancelled. Now, I like... Now, I really absolutely like the actor, because he looks like he would actually fit in that time period. And I just like him, because he's just, honestly, he's just some, like, guy that if you were to go to a fancy dinner and have a conversation with, he'll be a delight. But at the same time, he's a ruthless gangster, and, and would get his hands dirty. Also what makes it great because he is kind of based off a real life gangster and the fact that it takes place during obviously when the term gangster was really starting to rise in the prohibition era where they had all this wealth and power and all the violence that came with it makes me a, a little bit more to his side and I think that's all in part to Steve's performance and likability. He is a great character actor and hopefully one day he will get the chance to play a another act another character that will finally win him an Oscar nomination on, or an Oscar win that I feel he absolutely deserves. Number five, Ricardo the Dragon Diaz. If you've seen my, vid oh, my Arrow Top 10, you knew this character was going to appear. Ricardo Diaz was the main protagonist really in season six and reoccurring in season seven. He is basically a crime lord and a, and a drug kingpin. Mostly, most of his criminal activities comes through the, the drug trade and gun running. I like this guy because, well first off, if you see, if you want to see more about him, do watch my top 10 villains from the Arrow TV show video, but I like it because he was like, um, he was, his character was the combined element of all previous villains. He had the, you know, he had the intelligence, he had the strength, he had the organization, he had the fighting skills in a way, but at the same time, he also had the unstable and psychoticness. I like him because he was clear that he's been building this for years, and he achieves, and he achieves control of the city, he gets all the police department and politicians in his pocket, he gets control of the city's organized crime trade, but at the same time murders his way to becoming a member of the national crime syndicate called the Quadrant, becomes a member and eventually starts murdering to become a sole heir of the organization. I like him, now he's a character we love to hate, but we also understand why, he came from a poor background and had to really fight his way to respect, but then he also believes in loyalty and a brotherhood, oh, that's just what he proclaims to think, but in reality we know he only cares about himself and really has no loyalty to anyone but himself. Now, that's why I like him. He is no disillusioned with that. And he feels that because uh, how people have like, and he also has a distaste for those who have been growing up in privilege, and even for Oliver, because when he said how he just spent five years in hell, he was raised in it. He really suffered tragedy. Well, not tragedy really, well, I guess you could call his childhood tragedy, but he has suffered obstacle after obstacle to rise to the top, but even then, he's still insecure. People still view him as a street thug, a loser, 
no sophistication whatsoever. And his psychoticness, his personality, and even temper and insecurities cause him to essentially annihilate himself from his cr from his whole organization and of course his downfall. Kirk, he's betrayed by Kirk Exifero, probably pronouncing that butchering that last name wrong yet again, but basically I love how he portrays him as a cross between Michael Corleone and Antonio Montana. He is truly a person you believe physically rose up through the ranks, but also physically masterminded his whole organization. Now, I love this character have flaws, and the characters point out on it. And that's fun, because it's nothing wrong with having a character that has flaws, and we want to poke at them, we want to acknowledge them, and that leads to really great and interesting characters. People may not like this character because they view him too much as a street thug, and not much of a character. Now, Ricardo Diaz is based off the character Richard Dragon, but everyone should know by the New 52, he went by Ricardo Diaz Jr. and was portrayed more of that interpretation than, Ricard than Richard Dragon, which is why people are often very upset with the character. I personally never had any complaints with him. I always enjoyed him. And I feel that if people give him another analyst, they can really see how an effective villain he was and he managed to succeed in something that, another, that no other villains did. Anyway, to number four, Oswald Carbopart, the penguin from the TV show Gotham. I was really tempted to give him into the either number one spot or at least the top three, but looking at the others, I realized he had to be at least at number four. For everyone knows, the penguin is my favorite villain in comics, top ten favorite Batman villains, period. And I think the main reason for that is due to Robin Lord Taylor's performance. He truly gave us a unique interpretation of the Penguin. Just like with the Kingpin, we are seeing him evolve from being a low-level street thug in Gotham's mob to rise through the ranks to become the city's top crime lord. I like him because we see him as he rises through the ranks, and how even though he hates the nickname the Penguin, he's grown to embrace it. And he prefers to be called that over Mr. Carbopart. I like how he has clearly the ambitions, he has the skills, he has the smarts, the intelligence, and the drive. And as Gotham goes on, we see this man slowly become more similar to the comic character by season 5. I also like because the penguin in this show is humanized. We get to see him wanting to form relationships. The relationship with his mother has always been a contextual and important element to the penguin character. In season 4, we see him having developed this bond with his little kid Martin, but when he realizes Gotham is too dangerous and his well being is in jeopardy, he has not leave Gotham to never again come back. You see that Gotham is a place where the human element of your character cannot exist, and only the criminal bit can survive. And it's kind of sad to see that. Robin Lord Taylor really breathes life into this role, and I've said this time and time again, for comics, take a note of this performance, and maybe have the character be more, look at least similar to the design and look of the character on this show, and bring that version into the comics. Less of the more less of the more traditional look and go with a different direction. I personally would love to have this and I like how he looks more like a bird, he's not overweight, though he does become that in season 5 at the in the, its very last episode and dresses more like the penguin. As the series goes on, he begins to become more like the penguin, both in the way he dresses and his walk. Penguins always had this walk but here it's more realized, with the, it's more of a limp because of a broken leg he suffered. For me, I personally feel that this was arguably one of the greatest interpretations of the Penguin, and he's arguably the greatest villain and arguably character from the TV show Gotham. And I cannot continue this video without praising Lord's performance. He is arguably an example of humanizing a comic book character staying true to the source material, but taking creative liberties. All combo characters should do that. Number three, we have Cornell Stokes, aka Cottonmouth, from the TV show Luke Cage. Now, when it comes to Luke Cage, we've had several crime lord characters. 
Black Mariah, Cottonmouth, Diamond Pack, Bushmaster, Shade. But I think Cottonmouth stands up above the rest as being the most greatest character from the show. Betrayed by Mahershala Ali. Hopefully I'm not butchering that name. I really don't. I like Cornell Stokes by the beginning of the suit, by in the first, now he's really the main villain, arguably for the quite a few, a lot of the se first season, before Diamondback took control in the later, se in the later episodes of season one, and of course Bushmaster become the real proper protagonist of season two. Cornell Stokes, it was a member of the Stokes, of the Stokes family. And rose to become the biggest crime boss and crime lord in Harlem. Now, I like him for Ali making the character a laid-back dude, but willing to show signs of anger, and also humanizes him more than any other. First off, most creep people on this list got involved willingly into organized crime. What makes Cottonmouth different is he doesn't want to be, but is forced to. And never had the balls to say, no, I don't want to be a part of it. In his childhood, he wanted to be a musician, and he had the skills to play the piano and classical music. And he was groomed by his aunt to become the true, the next mob boss in Harlem. In his adulthood, he is still you know, regretful of his decisions and does not want to be a part of that life. Even though he runs the trade. But he pre but he puts on this persona of being a confident, uh, confident, a little bit of an arrogant man, and has, but deep down, he's always had this rivalry with the main hero of the series, Luke Cage, because he is exactly who he wants to be, though he brushes it off as him being beneath him, but in reality, he knows that, you know, this is the man that, you know, that he wants, that, is truly the man he really wished he could have become. I like the character how he's portrayed here. The suits he wears calls back to the the you know the suits are more in line with the snake Copperhead. Now cop now uh, Cottonmouth I should say. Now Cottonmouth is of course a character from the the Luke Cage comic series and is God and is the Godfather of Harlem. He looks drastically different to the comic book. And another thing that's interesting, he hates being called Cottonmouth, prefers to be called Mr. Stokes. And is the top mob boss, and is the top mob figure in Harlem. And he had a lot of friends in his early years. He was a friend with a guy named Pops, who was a notorious figure in Harlem. Not mob figure, but just respected by the community. And we do get to see his human side. When he finds out that he's dead, courtesy of one of his underlings, we see him throw him off the building. And he takes care of all the funeral arrangements, realizing and doesn't and doesn't fully and he's kind of struggles with guilt, taking trying to how he can't fully take responsibility for his death, but he knows that he played a role in it and he needs to make amends for that. He is truly a unique and interesting character, and one I think should be remembered as arguably being the greatest villain from the show. Now, Luke Cage, just like Daredevil, was is on the mar was part of Marvel and Netflix uh, agreement to make these TV shows and essentially they take place in the MCU but at the ground level. I'm really upset that this show didn't get a third season just like Daredevil should have gotten a fourth season. He was arguably a really great and fascinating character and I really like him for that fact. He's a very different type of mob figure, a person who doesn't want to be a part of it but he was groomed to be a part of it from an early age and that makes him kind of a tragic figure, though not a person you should take lightly. Number two is Walter White from Breaking Bad. Walter White is, well, first off, he was a, a school, he was a teacher. He was never a criminal. But after he found out that he was dying, he decided to use his genius, essentially, to create his own meth to sell in order to provide his family when he died. As a result, he became, but as a result, he then got involved into the illicit drug trade to become one of the most powerful and most revered crime lords, uh, drug kingpins, ever. 
as season by season, he's constantly going up against new enemies that threaten his business. Now, what I like about him is that he wasn't a bad guy when he started. He was just a man who just wanted to make sure his family was provided for when he died. But as the series went on, he developed to become more and more cruel, more heartless, and more of a monster, and even more villainous. He was portrayed by Brian Creston, hopefully that name is being pronounced right, and if this actor sounds familiar, well, he was in the sitcom Malcolm in the Middle. This show, for him, broke typecasting. Because I think by everyone, by this point, had a resume of being an, estab an either established actor on TV or even in movies. At least had an acting resume. This guy was known for a sitcom. And was more of known for comedy. This broke bar barriers to show that he was truly a phenomenal actor. I like this character because it's a different type of mobster. Or gangster, I should say. Because he's not part of the corrupt... First off, Cottonmouth was always a person who was reluctant to get involved. Everyone on the list wanted to be involved. He only got involved for his family's sake. And as the series went on, the good nature personality of him vaporized to become the monster by the end of the series. Now, there's nothing more I can say other than fantastic casting and a person who really showed his acting range, and proved that he was not a comedy actor. Walter White is arguably one of the greatest gangsters, but was also part of a group known as anti-heroes. The same with Omar Little, and even Jax Teller, and Naki Tanza. Most of these gangsters kind of become sort of anti-heroes, and who knows, maybe one day I'll do an anti-heroes in TV, but he was just arguably one of the most infamous in the ser in the series. But I like to think that many of these people on this list wouldn't be here without our number one. So without further ado, number one. Tony Soprano from The Sopranos. Just like Sons of Anarchy, there is so, and there's so many, many gangster characters that could put on this list. Hell, you could do a top ten gangsters from The Sopranos. Arguably Tony Soprano, betrayed, betrayed by James Gandolfini arguably started it all. In the show, Tony Soprano is a mobster in the New Jersey crime family. Eventually, he, by the end of the series, he is the, the boss of the family. James Gandolfini portrays him as the anti-hero. He's the nice guy you'd love to have at a barbecue, have dinner with, go to a football game. You know, he's just this guy who is very likable. And he's a stand-up guy. But in reality, he is a gangster. He does make money illegally. He does perform violent acts. He is arguably TV's first true anti-hero. And that's why I put him at number one. Because see, many of these gangsters are anti-heroes. And most of them are either so villainous, there's no good in them. Or they start out good, become evil by the end of the series. When we begin, we see him for the two sides that he is. He is a likable guy, but he also clearly has done violent acts. And as the series go on, him being in the life takes its toll on him. Physically, as he looks completely unhealthy by the end of the series, and also how he resembles very little of the man he was in season 1. And that just goes to show that this life, what it takes on a person, and he is truly an old school mobster. He believes in the code of, si of silence. He believes in the old school ways. But at the same time, he is part of the newer generation of mobsters. And he is arguably one of the most respected and feared within not just New Jersey, but even has made a name for himself that has transcended into the New York scene. He is truly a great I, great character portrayed by the, by the late... Gandolfini, and The Sopranos is just a great show in general, and I think most of it goes to its casting, especially Tony Soprano, and that's why I dub him the greatest TV gangster of all time. And there we have it, that is my top 10 gangsters from TV. Do you agree? What other mobsters or crime lords or even gangsters would you have had on this list? How would you have arranged it? Write down your names or mobster names in the comments. And until next time, this has been the Steven Hour. Thank you for watching.